Good evening and welcome to our uh, webinar tonight on uh, full field electroretinography in a retina practice with the Retival device. My name is Andrew Jones and I am the Vice President of North American Sales for LKC Technologies. Uh, before we begin the uh, presentation this evening, I'd like to review a housekeeping item. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the question function in GoToWebinar. All you need to do is open up the control panel using the orange arrow button. Uh, then you open up the question box and type in your question. Hit send and your question should appear in the question box. As our presenters are going through their presentations this evening, they'll stop from time to time, which will give me an opportunity to uh, pose those questions to the speakers. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers, uh, speakers for this evening. Uh, Dr. Quentin Davis is the Vice President of Operations and Development at LKC Technologies, where he is responsible for all the technical aspects of our UTAS and Retival products. Uh, Quentin is uh, really the brains behind the, the Retival device. Dr. Davis holds BS, MS, and PhD degrees uh, from MIT in electrical engineering and computer science. Dr. Davis will be presenting this evening on full field ERG and the Retival device. Our second presenter this evening is Dr. Pamela Weber. Dr. Weber completed her undergraduate degree at McGill University and went on to medical school at Columbia University. She completed her residency at New York Eye and Ear and her fellowship in vitreoretinal retinal disease and surgery at the Shepin's Eye Institute at Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary at Harvard. Dr. Weber is a member of the National Register's Who's Who and is a Castle Connolly and Newsday top doctor. She's been involved in international studies for diabetes, AIDS, and macular degeneration. She has a special interest in retinopathy of prematurity and has participated in several NEI-funded ROP studies, including serving on the Executive Committee and the Outcomes Committee for STOP ROP. Dr. Weber is the owner of Island Retina in Shirley, New York. So without further ado, I'll hand things over to Dr. Davis. Quentin, please take it away. Thanks, Andrew. So I'm gonna start with tonight's presentation with just trying to describe, give some background on ERGs and the Retival device in general. And then Dr. Rubber will try to give more of a clinical cases and examples of how it's actually useful in practice. The next slide. So first, let me address why ERGs aren't particularly widely used. And I think some of it is just historical. The ophthalmoscope was invented about 70 years before the electroretinogram. So kind of doctors from, you know, from the 19 or from the 1850s on have been looking in the back of the eye. And that's kind of been the the way to describe and look at diseases. There's things like white dot syndrome because, well, there are white dots on the, on the retina. So, you know, let me contrast that with cardiology. So in cardiology, the electrocardiogram was developed about 70 years before imaging, before ultrasound. Um, and what's the go-to modality in cardiology? Well, it is still the first thing that was invented the EKG. But just in cardiology and in retina practice, you can kind of get more information if you have both modalities at your disposal. And another reason why ERGs might not be widely used is because, you know, for the, for the longest time, they were kind of super difficult to do. They had took up like a whole room of space um, the tests were long, they were difficult to interpret, um, and that kind of led doctors to maybe have one class in it and then forget about it in school. But we've designed the Retival device to try to address these issues, to make it super simple to use and easy to interpret the results. Go to the next slide. So what does the ERG waveform look like? So on the right side, I'm going to plot versus time, on the x-axis, the voltage measured at the front of the eye on the, on the y-axis. And at time equals zero, there's going to be a flash of light. So the next slide shows light coming in through the cornea and striking the retina. On the next slide, you see the, the spark of the electrical response as the light goes 
and gets converted from light into electricity. That conversion happens in the rods and cones. What we're showing here is a photopic test, light adapted. So the conversion is happening in the cones. And so the first thing that happens to the electrical response is it goes down, forming the A wave, which is a function of primarily of the cones and the off bipolar cells. The off bipolar cells because they're saying, hey, the light's no longer off. If we go to the next slide, that electrical signal from the cones gets processed by the inner retina. That first stage happens in the bipolar cells, forming the B wave. And that shows the function of the bipolar cells of the inner retina. The bipolar cells in the next slide hand the information off to the retinal ganglion cells. And those retinal nerve fiber layers then propagate the information to the brain through the optic nerve. Electrically, that forms that second depression labeled PHNR for a photopic negative response, which is a function of the retinal ganglion cells. Now, this waveform was for one flash of light. A lot of what Dr. Weber is going to show doesn't have one flash of light, but has many flashes of light, and the flashes are very close in time. See this x-axis goes, the middle is zero milliseconds, and there's the 50 milliseconds. She's gonna present data where the flashes are only 35 milliseconds apart, which means that these waveforms get kind of smooshed on top of each other to form what's called a flicker response. And what you're going to see there is a kind of a waveform which is indicative primarily of bipolar cell function. And the nice thing about bipolar cell function is it requires a working cone system, so a working outer retina, and a working inner retina. So with one simple test, you can kind of get an idea of is the whole retina working. So if we go to the next slide, let me tell you a little bit about the Redival device. As you can see, it's handheld. It has a screen so you can see with a camera so you can see kind of in real time what's going on with the patient's eye. You can see if their eyes are closed, you can coach them to open it. It's the first and only FDA cleared non-midriatic handheld device. Why do I emphasize non-midriatic? Well, all other ERG devices, they recommend that you dilate the eye so the same amount of light makes it into the pupil. The red adult device measures pupil size. So when the pupil is small, they can flash brighter. When the pupil is large, it can flash dimmer. So you can compensate for a natural pupil. So dilating drops are not required. You can use them, but not required. The other thing about the red bell device in the, in the front is an integrating sphere or a big 60 millimeter diameter white ball and the light gets bounced around in there, so the stimulus to the eye is very diffuse. The nice thing about a diffuse stimulus is it doesn't really matter where the patient's looking. And if they have a cataract, so maybe if you're trying to image the back of the eye, things look fuzzy because of the cataract. That doesn't matter. That's primarily a scattering, and that scattering of a diffuse light just makes it a little more diffuse, no problem. And the device is really easy to use. It has just a joystick. If you're doing the photopic tests for the cone function, which is what Dr. Weber is showing, the tests are completed in just minutes. The device can do kind of all the tests. So if you have your inherited retinal disease patient where you're worried about congenital stationary night blindness or retinitis pigmentosa, it can do those dark adapted tests too to look for rod function but then the tests are significantly longer. The interface is really simple. The reports are these beautifully rendered PDF reports that generate reference data for you. So kind of all the important features are already marked on them and compared with age-matched normal vision subjects. Next slide. So the rest of the red valve device, we saw the handheld part in the other one. On the left side, you can see that it fits in this docking station. The docking station has a USB connection 
to be able to connect to any computer that you already own. And it just acts like a USB drive or a thumb drive. And you can just copy off the PDF reports, print it out, give a copy to the patient if you'd like, and put it in your EMR system. <laughs> and the patient see. If you look in the middle of the screen here, you can kind of see what the patient sees. A diffuse white source and with three kind of holes in the back. The three holes are for the infrared LED for doing infrared imaging of the pupil, a fixation light so they can look at it, and the camera lens. Then the black outside is also flipped over so you can see it with the person looking out at you. So it just contacts the bony orbit around the eye, nothing touches the eye. Then because we're measuring an electrical response, so light comes in, gets converted into electricity by the retina, we pick up that electrical signal on the skin, just like for the heart, you know, it's beating, and but it's making an electrical signal that's picked up by the electrodes on the chest. Here we're picking up with electrodes underneath the eye, and those electrodes are all in that convenient sensor strip patch. The next slide shows that we have wide clinical evidence. So we have papers on glaucoma, on diabetic retinopathy, on rare inherited diseases, on the effect of cataracts, kind of the, runs the gamut. We even have papers on using the device for schizophrenia. Um, wide, wide evidence. I think there have been two papers published already this month, and um, you know, I published a paper on it last month, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. Oh, not in the next slide, sorry, in a few slides. First, no, no, we can go to the next slide. So for the interpreting the results, for the reference data, we, we um, color code the results for you. So the middle 90%, which goes from the fifth percentile to the 95th percentile, is colored green. So that means the results are consistent with someone who has normal vision. Then the next two and a half percent on each side is kind of the, the, the marginal zone. And then the red zone is the part that's outside the 95th percent reference interval. So the bottom two and a half percent and the top two and a half percent. So that 5% on the outside, well, you know, 5% is one out of every 20 normal subjects. So it can happen and does happen that someone with normal vision is in the red zone. But by construction, it happens one out of every 20 times for a 95% specificity. But it's still nice to, uh, so I'll show you some data to keep that highlighted red because, you know, they're just not quite typical for a normally sighted person. Now, they're not typical. That doesn't mean they're diseased. For looking at timing, if they're too fast, they're probably okay. They might be a good candidate for the Olympic ping pong team or something else that requires really fast reflexes. Maybe they're a professional baseball player. So, or maybe, you know, they're just a normal person, but just really fast. So, but now if they're too slow on timing, now that's indicative of cellular stress. That's an un, that could be, um, you know, indicative of an unhappy retina. Cellular stress, maybe they have some ischemic disease. Um, they're having advancing retinitis pigmentosa, something like that that's just stressing the cells. Now for amplitudes, if the amplitudes are too big, well, there's almost never too big. So they're probably okay. They just have a really strong responsive retina. But too small of an amplitude, that's the sign of trouble. That's indicative of unresponsive cells, cells that have died, something that's wrong. Now, I will warn you on amplitudes in particular, too small of an amplitude could also mean that you didn't place the sensor strip correctly you place it too far away from the eye. So you do have to kind of be careful on the small amplitudes to make sure your technician did the test right. So go to the next slide. So just a little bit more about how you think about the results. So if they're in the green zone, the middle 90%, they're almost certainly okay. And if they're in the borderline zone, you might be wanting to, you know, take them a little more close look at them, maybe a little more frequent follow-up. If they're in the red zone, 
you know, that's that's starting to sound like danger. But remember, this is still just one test. It's an aid in diagnosis. You still need a good clinical history. You still want to kind of consider this along with all the other information that you have on diagnostic tests you have about the patient before you make your own diagnosis. So the next slide shows an example of some patient results. So the top little bit under patient information shows the patient ID, which is what, int what, what you enter, and the birth date. It's kind of important to at least have the birth year correct because the reference data is age matched. Then a little bit about the device, and then here's the test. So on the right eye, we conveniently tell you that the pupil was, was 7.3 millimeters in diameter. So this was a dilated subject. The left eye didn't dilate quite so much, 5.1 millimeters. But that doesn't matter. This test compensates for pupil size. So whatever results you see, they're, they're good for a five millimeter pupil, a seven millimeter pupil, a two millimeter pupil, doesn't matter. If we just look at the bottom row, you can see versus time from zero to 100 milliseconds, you can see voltage on the y-axis. And this is like what I said, this is the, the light is flashing sufficiently fast that you don't really see that a wave, B wave photopic negative response I showed you earlier is all smooshed together and something which is measuring bipolar cell function. But for the bipolar cells to function, the cones have got to be working too. You can see at the top that we measure, at the top of those graphs, that we measure an implicit time and an amplitude. We give you the time in milliseconds, but also if you look at the right eye, it's 85 percentile. So it's in the 85th percentile for reference data. And it shows you what the reference, um, reference interval is beside that. Or you could just look at the plot and see that nice rectangle. If that peak is inside the rectangle, then it's within the 95th percentile. This is someone who has normal vision. The next slide shows you someone who's in trouble. If you look at the bottom row, again, you can see everybody is angry red. So if you look at the waveform, you see that it's, it's too slow. It's outside that rectangle. It's below the rectangle and to the right of the rectangle. If you look at the right eye at the bottom, 35.3 milliseconds in time, the 99th percentile. So 99% of people with normal vision have a faster time than that. What about the amplitude, the second percentile? Only 2% of people with normal vision have an amplitude that small. What about the left eye? It's even worse, 100 percentile for timing. All 100% of our reference data had a faster time. Amplitude, 0%. That means that 0% that of people with normal vision in our reference data had an amplitude that's small. This person is in trouble. If you go to the next slide, this was the paper that I just published in August. There's the link to it. Um, in this slide, I'm going to talk to you about the Redivals Diabetic Retinopathy Assessment Protocol. And this protocol has had about six publications regarding it. But I'm just going to show you the results of the, of the latest. So on the x-axis is the Redival DR score from 16 to 28. And on the vertical axis, you see the percent of people, subjects, having an ocular intervention. We followed 279 subjects for three years after this Redival test and asked the question, who had an ocular intervention, meaning for diabetic retinopathy, who had vitrectomy, injections, or laser? And the blue curve shows how many people had an intervention what percentage had an intervention after one year or two years or three years for the green curve. So as you can see, as that DR score increases, the likelihood of having an intervention increases. Now the DR score is comprised of three elements. On the next slide, we show the first of those three elements. We have the next slide. So here I'm showing the flicker in timing. So on the x-axis, 
you see the timing going from 26 milliseconds to 40 milliseconds. Or on the top side of the x-axis, the reference percentiles, from the zeroth percentile to the hundredth percentile. And I've even shaded the green zone, the yellow zone, and the red zone. The vertical axis is the same as the top plot, the percent having an ocular intervention. So as you can see, as that flicker time gets into the red zone of longer and longer times, those are the people who are in trouble for having an ocular intervention. So the unhealthy people are with the longer implicit time. The next slide shows that the DR score also has an amplitude component. So here on the x-axis, I plotted the amplitude from zero microvolts to 40 microvolts. And again, the reference percentiles are on the top with the shading representing the color coding. So you can see that as you get to smaller and smaller amplitudes and into the red zone, those are the people who are in trouble for having an ocular intervention. The third component of the DR score is the pupil area ratio. So we measure the pupil area from a dim flickering light and a bright flickering light. So a normally sighted person, well, the pupil is gonna be smaller in the bright flickering light. So the difference in brightness is a factor of eight. So if the light's eight times bigger, normal people, the area of the pupil might be twice as small for the eight times brighter light. But as the pupil becomes less reactive, as you get closer to one, my pupil size didn't change, those people are in danger of having an ocular intervention. Now, a little bit of carefulness has to be applied to the pupil area ratio. If you've artificially dilated the subject, well, then they're going to have a very poor pupil response anyway. So there's a little bit of caveat for there. So those are the three components of the Red Eval DR score. Outside the U.S., you actually get the score. Inside the U.S., we're working on this, but right now we just show the individual plots of time, amplitude, and pupil area ratio. So if they're in the red zone for all three of those, they're definitely in trouble. If they're in the red zone for two of them, then, you know, I would also be concerned. Um, and even one, if it's especially if it's the timing, the timing is really delayed, they're in trouble. Anyway, so that was all I was going to talk about. So before I hand it over to Dr. Weber, I don't know, Andrew, if we want to entertain any questions or do we want to just jump into some cases? Quentin, actually, I have one question so far, and um, uh, the question is from uh, Donna Bong. It's how, how young does your normative data start at, and does it compare to groups from certain age ranges? Um, so so um, first, the, the range goes from four years old to 85. So that's the, that's the age group that we have. Um, the second one, for binning data, I don't like to bend data. The problem with binning data, say every decade of, well, if you're between 30 and 39, you're, you're, this is the reference range, then 40 to 49 is this reference range. Do you really think that on that 40th birthday, whammo, all of a sudden I'm completely different and my reference range is different? So the Red Eval device has a smoothly changing uh, reference data with age. So there are no kind of jumps between bin groups. Um, so the reference data is from four to 85. And then we kind of extrapolate out on both ends after that. So it's probably pretty good, you know, for a little bit out. Definitely if you're, if you're a pediatrician and you're worried about somebody who's like younger than six months old, then it's almost certainly a little dubious to use it. Um, but kind of, if you just go out a little bit, it'd probably work fine. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davis. Um, I, that's it for, for questions so far. There'll be an opportunity to ask uh, Dr. Davis some questions at the end of the presentations as well. All right, so um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davis. Uh, I, I will hand things off to Dr. Weber, who now will uh, take us through some interesting cases uh, uh, of common retinal conditions. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to join you this evening. Um, so when we're evaluating retinal disease, we are very quick to grab an OCT or possibly a fluorescein or an ICG. 
and these this, these technologies are great, no doubt, and they give us a wealth of information about the structure of the retina. But they don't really give us an objective or quantitative measure of retinal function and physiology. So I have enjoyed incorporating the retaval in my practice and use it on a daily basis. And the following cases demonstrate how I am using it. I feel that the results often give me a deeper understanding and a different perspective of the disease process, which I think leads to better management. So perhaps this lecture will entice you to change your habits and include ERG testing in the management of your retinal patients. So the first case is a case of diabetic macular edema. And in this case, we wanted to monitor the effect effectiveness of treatment using the full field ERG. And this first patient is an 84-year-old female who was diagnosed with diabetes in 2006 and de developed diabetic macular edema around 2011. I treated both eyes. She was a pseudophagic and her comorbidities included hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and I had to um, treat her on multiple occasions. And this just gives you a summary of the right and the left eye treatment. And as you can see, we really had to do quite a bit, a lot of focal laser, micropulse, Avastin, Triessence, Lucentis, and then eventually I, I went to Alluvian in 2015. And then the left eye, she also had vitreomacular macular traction syndrome on top of the chronic DME. And so um, we did focal, micropulse, Avastin, Lucentis, also Jotrea to treat the VMT triessence and um, a, a, a pars plane of vitrectomy, uh, again, for the VMT. And finally, Illuvian in 2015. So prior to the Illuvian injection, the visual acuity in the right eye was 2040 and the antracular pressure was 16. And on the left-hand side, you can see the fluorescein angiogram, which really nicely demonstrates the extensive diabetic macular edema with cysts of edema and open microaneurysms and some focal laser. And on the right-hand screen, you see the OCT that also demonstrates um, the multiple cysts. The left eye looked very similar and her visual acuity in this eye was 2050. The intraocular pressure was 16. The fluorescein on the left-hand side uh, clearly demonstrates the many pockets of cystic edema associated with diabetic macular edema, the microaneurysms, and the and some focal laser. And on the right-hand side, we again, we see a very similar picture um, with the OCT with uh, multiple layers of edema. So the top line represents the fluorescein prior to Illuvian, and then in 2017, another fluorescein reveals how sh this patient looked after Illuvian. And you can see that there's quite a marked improvement um, and that there is way better control of the diabetic macular edema um, and a much less boggy looking macula. And in the left eye, it was ver a very similar picture. So the top row compares 2015 to 2017. And again, you can see that there's a distinct improvement in the diabetic macular edema. Uh, 15 months after Alluvian in the right eye, she was 20-25, and I, did, I had not had to do any further treatment. And you can see that there's nice foveal depression. In the left eye, a uh, little bit of irregularity from the um, ILM peel, peel associated with the pars plane of vitrectomy, but she's 2040, and no further treatment has been rendered either. And when we plotted the change of central uh, uh, the, of central thickness in the OCT over time, you can see as soon as we gave the alluvian. Um, in 2015, there was a dramatic um, improvement in the OCT with a decrease in uh, central thickness in both eyes. So how did we incorporate ERG testing with this? Well, I didn't have the technology in 2015, so I can't show you prior to Illuvian, but um, I can show you 2018 and 2019. And what I want to bring to your attention is that you can see with the diabetic retinopathy assessment on the top, um, it's 15, which is a really great number. So this gave me a lot of confidence knowing that for the time being, I had this patient well controlled and that um, I could put, you know, push appointments out a little bit further. And then when we compare 2018 to 2019, again, you can actually see that um, that we're in within the uh, normal um, uh, normative database and that the um, the implicit time and the amplitude looks really good in both eyes. So the full field ERG shows normal implicit time and, and, and amplitude in both eyes. The implicit time continued to improve um, on the follow-up uh, uh, 
full field ERG. So you can see the patient had a strong response to Alluvian, not just with retinal structure, but also with retinal function. So I feel like the full field ERG allowed me to be more comfortable increasing time between appointments. The next case is non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy progressing to proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And I think this case demonstrates how neuroretinal dysfunction can be picked up on ERG, uh, sometimes before microvascular changes. So this is a 39-year-old uh, type 1 diabetic who's had diabetes for 20 years. And his medications included Levomir, uh, Novolog, Proventil, and Novolin. The best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 2020 and in the left eye 2025. Uh, and treatment was started in both eyes for diabetic macular edema. And you can see um, in 2016, when he first presented to me, there was really quite a bit of edema, um, which is well demonstrated in the fluorescein an angiogram. So you can see the circinate heart exudates with microangiopathy, interretinal, interretinal hemorrhages. There was some focal laser and quite a bit of, um, of edema. So I began treatment, and in 2017, you can see that I'm making progress. There are fewer heart exudates, and the edema looks a little bit better un under control, but certainly he needed more treatment. In the left eye, uh, there was non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema, but it was not quite as severe as the left eye, as the right eye. So you can see in 2016, there were some heart exudates, and there was definitely uh, DME. Um, with staining. You can also see that there was some laser. Um, and in 2017, uh, there's still edema, but we are making some progress. Some of the hard exudates have had cleared. In 2017, I got a ERG, and you can see with the diabetic retinopathy assessment, it was abnormal at 24.3. So when I see this number, I know I have to keep on top of this patient, keep treating, and watch the patient carefully. And the implicit time and the amplitude was pretty much okay in both eyes. Uh, he did require quite a bit of treatment with both anti-VEGF and laser. In 2018, a year later, the, the ERG uh, looked about the same. The diabetic retinopathy ass assessment was still high. Um, the amplitude and the implicit time looked okay. Um, the amplitude seemed a little bit better. Um, we continued treatment. The ERG in 2019 looked a little different to me. When I looked, when I compared the right eye to the left eye, I noticed that there was a change and that the implicit time was borderline normal, but now the amplitude in the left eye had dropped into the red zone. And, um, and I began to wonder about that. Um, and I began to think, is something going on? Is there a possible progression of the ischemia? And as we followed this patient, um, sure enough, we started to see NVE, which you can see in the supertemporal quadrant in this fluorescein angiogram. So the drop in amplitude and borderline implicit time were a red flag to watch for ischemia. And neuroretinal dysfunction can be picked up on the ERG and can be seen sometimes before the microvascular changes. What I found interesting is that the left eye had received fewer injections because there was less diabetic macular edema um, than the right. And as I think back, I'm wondering if the, if the anti-VEGF injections that were given more frequently uh, kept the right eye from, uh, from advancing to proliferative disease. He has maintained good vision. His visual acuity is 20-32 in the right eye and 20-20 uh, in the left. He's required a lot of treatment. Um, with a full field ERG, diabetic ret retinopathy assessment was high, which alerted us to keep follow appointments on a tighter schedule. And the drop in amplitude in the left eye alerted us to watch for further ischemia like NVE and treat that eye more aggressively. The next case is asymmetric proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And I think that this case demonstrates how we can monitor effectiveness of treatment with the full field ERG. The patient is a 47 year old male who was diagnosed with diabetes in 2005 and diabetic macular edema in 2015. Both eyes were treated, he is phagic, 
and the comorbidities included hypothyroidism and hypercholesterolemia, and he had multiple eye treatments. I think when you look at this ERG, you notice right off the bat that the right eye is very different than the left. Um, and when you look at the diabetic retinopathy assessment, again, you can see that the number is high. Um, so in the right eye, we see that the implicit time is, is long, it's 35, and the amplitude is low, as comp especially compared to the left eye. And on fundus photography, you can observe that there's a vitreous hemorrhage in the right eye, and there was proliferative diabetic retinopathy with NVD and NVE, whereas the left eye had non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. I think the fluorescein angiogram shows this better. You can see the leakage from the NVD as well as the leakage from the NVE in the supranasal quadrant and the uh, blanc transmission from the vitreous hemorrhage, whereas the left eye had a uh, much more uh, mild disease with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and some diabetic macular edema. The vision in the right eye was 2320 and in the left uh, 2040. So we fast forward two years. Um, I have gotten the right eye under better control with laser and intravitreal injections. You can see the regressed NVD um, with some cicatricial tissue and the lasers. The left eye has remained non-proliferative and has not required treatment. So this is the ERG from 2018 compared to 2020. And I think one thing you can note is that the, um, the amplitude has recovered a little bit and looks, looks better. And, um, and the left eye seems very stable. The next case is a case of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And again, um, this case demonstrates how we can monitor effectiveness of treatment using full field ERG. So you can see in the optomap of the right eye that there's a dense vitreous hemorrhage. This is a 41-year-old who had type 2 diabetes for seven years, had hypertension, um, hypercholesterolemia, and was on Ambien, Xanax, Simvastin, Metformin. The best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was count fingers from the vitreous hemorrhage associated with the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And in the left eye, she was 20-25, um, but there was proliferative diabetic retinopathy as well. So this is a very interesting ERG. You can see that the diabetic retin retinopathy assessment is high at 28. You can also observe that the implicit time is really high. It's above 35 and the amplitude is low in, in the left eye, in the right eye. In the left eye, there is also um, a prolonged implicit time um, into a dangerous zone, um, and, and the amplitude is, is also slightly decreased. So again, fast forward one year, um, I got the right under, under better control with vitrectomy, anti-VEGF, laser, uh, the visual QD now is 2032 and in the left eye 2025. Um, and we have controlled disease at this point. When we compare the 2018 ERG to the 2019, I want to draw to your attention that now you can see the diabetic retinopathy assessment is much lower. It's 23. So it it, we got it into a normal range, which makes me very feel very comfortable moving forward that this patient is, is pretty well controlled. And in the immediate time period, I'm not going to have a lot of problems and I can start to stretch out the appointments a little bit more. You can also see um, that the implicit time has, has, is shorter now. It has improved. The uh, amplitude is a little bit better um, in both eyes. So... So this gave me confidence that the patient would not be advancing to neovascular glaucoma and that you know I, I was in a better situation with this patient. The next case is ischemic proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Um, and in this case, I wanna demonstrate how you can predict progression of neovascular, to, to new neovascular glaucoma from abnormal implicit times. So this is a 58-year-old type two diabetic um, with hypertension and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the medications include Lantus, aspirin, uh, sulfazalazine, and uh, metoprolol. The 
best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 2125 and in the left 2063. And you can see in the red free picture of the right eye that there is NVD and diabetic macular edema um, with heart exudates and microangiopathy. In the left eye, there's a similar picture with NVD and um, diabetic macular edema with heart exudates and microangiopathy. I did treat this patient aggressively, but despite receiving anti-VEGF and PRP, she did develop a neovascular glaucoma and did require a, a glaucoma surgery with Ahmed valve placement in both eyes. So one thing that that I think of when, I, when I'm evaluating these diabetic patients is if I start to see implicit times greater than 35, I know the patient could be at high risk for neovascular glaucoma. And it's really important to, to look for this and to maybe do gonioscopy or, um, or on fluorescein, um, get pictures of the iris to look for iris leakage. Um, and here again, you can see that the, the both the um, implicit time and the amplitude is falling outside of the normative database. Um, and the implicit times are very long um, and the amplitudes are, are are somewhat decreased. Dr. Weber, I'm sorry to interrupt. I had uh, a couple of questions with regards, I thought it would be a natural time to ask you about diabetic retinopathy. Um, one of the attendees was wondering, how long does it take per eye to perform full field ERG for diabetic retinopathy? Oh, it's, it's extremely short. I think um, uh, maybe a minute or two. Okay, and how often do you recommend performing full field ERG for patients uh, with diabetic retinopathy? So what I like to do is I like to do it initially when I'm first evaluating the patient to kind of get a sense of where we're at. Um, and then um, pretty much yearly, unless I see uh, something that, that seems like a dramatic change. And then of course I would repeat the ERG um, uh, uh, in a shorter time span. Okay. Thank you. And a, a follow-up question uh, from another attendee. Um, do you use the device for other macular disorders, for example, AMD or uh, ERM? No. Um, since it's full field, it really doesn't give you any additional information. You know, it, it's, I think you would have to use like a, a pattern or, you know, e ERG for something like that. Um, and, um, and this device doesn't have that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the right, next case, should we move on to the next case? Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so the next case is central retinal vein occlusion. And here I'm using this to uh, show you how you can predict pro progression of visual, uh, of visual loss um, from, from abnormal implicit times and amplitudes. And here you can see on the OptoMap that there's um, uh, a central retinal vein occlusion, uh, which is pretty advanced with extensive intraretinal hemorrhage. And this is a 69-year-old uh, female. Her comorbidities included hypertension and breast cancer. The best corrected visual acuity uh, in the right eye is 2400 and in the left 2025. And on her ERG, what you'll note is that the implicit time is very long and the amplitude is, is very low. Um, especially compared to the left eye. So with this kind of picture, I know that the chances of me uh, seeing a visual improvement in this patient is low and that I really need to watch for, um, for neovascular glaucoma. And I did treat this patient aggressively, of course, um, but she remained 2400 and, um, and she needs to be monitored for progression to ischemic uh, disease. Uh, the next patient is um, is a very interesting patient, a patient with retinitis pigmentosa. And I think in this particular case, I'm interested in showing how perhaps we can use this to see a response to experimental treatment. Um, so here you can see that the ERG is extinguished. This is a 56-year-old patient of mine who has Usher syndrome with hearing loss. Uh, we did the genetic testing and it revealed that she's um, USH2A. Uh, which is better than USH1, um, but still doesn't carry a great prognosis. And her best corrected visual acuity right now is 2063 in the right eye and 2050 in the left. So, you know, this is a patient who um, really needs to get into an experimental protocol soon. 
um, she, you know, her acuity is hanging in there um, by a thread and I'm trying to get her into a study right now. And I'm hoping that by uh, using this, um, some sort of ERG testing, we could see her response to, um, a, uh, you know, an investigative treatment. And you can see as we look at the um, Optimap that she has an atrophic, atrophic retinas with uh, fine bone spiculing and narrowing of the arterioles and some pallor to the optic nerve. And on the, on the fundus autofluorescence done on Optimap, you can clearly see um, the changes and on how there's a, a bullseye maculopathy. So again, this is a poor prognosis patient and we're really, I'm really working on trying to get her into a study. Um, and the um, OCT shows that there's retinal thinning and in the left eye there's retinal thinning, but also a little bit of a trace edema. So as I said, I'm hoping that with the ERG, we can maybe um, see if she responds to um, an experimental treatment protocol. Uh, this is um, a patient with a repaired retinal detachment, and here I feel like the full field um, ERG gives us a better understanding, a deeper understanding of what's happening with the uh, with the retinal disease. This is a patient that had a macula off regmatogenous retinal detachment, uh, which was repaired with a pneumatic retinopexy in 2008. And her vision did improve dramatically from count fingers to 2050. And you can see that the retinal tear was at 10 o'clock and there's good cryo surrounding that. And structurally, the retina looks really good. And so us retina specialists are like, yay, good outcome. But when we look at the um, ERG, we sort of think, huh, not as good as I thought. <laughs> so um, here you can see that the amplitude is down, especially compared to the left eye. Um, so again, it kind of gives me a deeper understanding of, of the retinal function with, with this case. And, and I think it may be a way to you know, quantitate um, uh, outcomes when we're looking at uh, different, trying to compare different procedures and trying to figure out uh, you know, what's the best procedure uh, for a given diagnosis. Uveitis, again, I think we can use this to help um, design effective treatment protocols and see how patients are responding. Uh, this is a 71-year-old uh, uh, male with a history of uveitis and pars planitis um, that I've been treating for quite some time. The right eye fared better. The left eye had um, a serous retinal detachment and, and choroidal detachments, as you can see in the Optomap on the right-hand side. And it, you know, I was able to control it with um, triessence um, and his vision is good, but again, you can see the modeled appearance on the fundus autofluorescence on the bottom with, that we, we obtained with the Optomap. And again, very interestingly, you can see that there's a big difference between the two eyes um, and that the left eye um, has, has been damaged from this recurrent uveitis. Um, with a prolonged um, implicit time and um, a lower amplitude. And again, I think we can use this to try to, you know, maybe figure out response to, you know, effective treatment protocols. Uh, here's another interesting case of toxoplasmosis. And this is um, a younger patient of mine um, who's 35 years old. The right eye was never affected, but the left eye um, had um, toxo, which I've had to treat uh, a couple of times. Unfortunately, he developed macular scarring, so his vision in the left eye, best corrected, is 2200. The right eye is really good, 2016. And uh, this is interesting because you'll notice that the implicit time um, is really short. So the right eye is really functioning well um, and has a nice um, amplitude, whereas uh, the toxoplasmosis um, has, has, caused, has caused damage in cell death. And um, and has been injured by, by this toxoplasmosis. So again, I think that the full field ERG kind of helps me understand uh, more fully what's happening with the retina, uh, particularly with retinal function. So, you know, in summary, what I really want to express tonight is that it's, you know, the full field ERG is a powerful tool in the retina practice, and it, and it really can be used daily, as you can see. You know, we can use it for our, our vascular diseases. Um, and I really feel that it gives me a deeper understanding of retinal disease because I can really finally um, 
quantitatively measure the function and the physiology of the retina as as compared to just structure. Um, so I feel that this leads to better patient management. You know, so I, I hope um, you will consider changing your habits and maybe incorporating the retinal into your practice. Uh, thank you. On a, on a side note, um, they just I just wanted to also mention that um, ERG, the billing for ERG has been really a delight. I haven't had any problems. We don't need any kind of pre-certifications. I haven't had any insurance companies turn it down. And you know, uh, we you know we uh, at least in my practice we struggle with the drug billing for our intravitreal injections, which is tedious and difficult and varies from insurance company to insurance company. So this has been rather delightful doing the billing. And I just wanted to throw that in uh, for any of you who are interested in the management side of this stuff. Great, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weber. Thank you very much, Dr. Davis. Um, I uh, am opening it up to questions now. So if you have any questions, please feel free to um, submit them using the question functionality and go to webinar. I'll start with the first question. And this question actually is both for Dr. Weber and for Dr. Davis. So if you could both take a crack at this, that'd be great. Uh, the question is, uh, can this device perform a regular ERG to rule out retinal degenerations or dystrophy? I guess we'll start with uh, Dr. Davis. Yes, you can do the the whole ISO five-step, six-step protocol. So kind of for any of your inherited diseases, it can do rod function testing. It can do the cone function testing. It can do the specialized testing like it's used for uh, enhanced S-cone syndrome. It has on-off protocols to differentiate between on bipolar cell function and off bipolar cell function, which can be useful for differentiating between incomplete and complete congenitary, congenital stationary night blindness. So they can kind of do, if, if there's a full field ERG test, it can do it. And it can also do flash VEPs, by the way, too. So you can get some kind of optic nerve function um, through the chiasm as well. The, th the things that it can't do, like, like Dr. Weber has already mentioned, is um, it can't do a multifocal ERG, it can't do a pattern ERG, because it's, it only has the gonzo, it only has the integrating sphere. All right, so Dr. Weber, do you, do you ever use it for uh, retinal degenerations or dystrophies? Oh, uh, yes, I do. Um, but, y you know, in my practice, I just don't see that much of that. So I think, you know, if, if you're in a university setting or you have, you know, um, a special program in your hospital for something that, like that, it might be more useful. But yes, I do use it on occasion. All right. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question. Uh, it's uh, from uh, an audience member who's a pediatric ophthalmologist, and um, I was, he was uh, wondering if you see children or have you used this uh, with children, with kids? No, I have not, but there are there are papers about this, and I know it is being used in in the pediatric population, and I think it's quite successful. And if I could throw something in, you know, I've heard I've heard um, you know with, with the you know with the, the the newborn, then kind of everything's easy. But when you get to like the the terrible twos, then everything is hard. Um, and but you know, I've heard doctors saying they have much better success with this. I mean, at the extreme case, you have to put the kid under general anesthesia to get kind of any kind of of, of eye testing done. Um, but I've heard doctors say that kind of with this device that and they've gotten rid of like 90, 95% of all their anesthesia people who they would normally put under anesthesia, they could get kind of, um, even for the terrible twos, kind of good enough information without having to anesthetize the child um, to, to get ERGs. And that's really important because, you know, there's been studies shown that, that general anesthesia on a, on a developing child can cause kind of some cognitive issues even down the line. And uh, Quentin, I was just wondering, uh, I saw a recent study that was done looking at um, use of uh, full field ERG in, in uh, really young patients with uh, closed eyelids. Uh, is that something that, that you uh, might be able to comment on? Um, 
Yes. Uh, you know, b before I go to that, let me just say one more thing about in general. So why would you ever test someone with like, a, you know, a pediatric ophthalmologist? You know, you're worried that that, you know, the, the, the your six month old has nystagmus. It's not, you know, the baby's not following mom, not smiling. Those kind of cases are the ones that are for the really young cases that, that you would want to do it for. Um, when they get a little older, they might be running into things at night um, where, you know, you don't have problems. They could have family members that have inherited diseases. Those are kind of some of the kind of the, the big draws, you know, for, you know, um, for like the, the really small infants, there's been some researchers who are trying to, you know, get better diagnostic tools for retinopathy of prematurity, which of course is a, you know, is a, is a terrible debilitating disease where kind of if they're in the NICU and they're on too much oxygen, then when they get off oxygen, then kind of bad things can happen in the retina and they can go blind. Um, so, but, you know, if you poke and prod a, a, a someone who's just born or in the NICU, you know, born prematurely, then a lot of those tests are really traumatic for them. And you can measure that trauma by, you know, heart rates that race for you know, hours afterwards and things like that. And so some, some, just some early research is trying to do ERG testing while the infant is asleep with their eyes closed. Um, and kind of enough light can make it through the eyelid that you can still get some diagnostic utility. But you know, that work is kind of really early stage now. So that's, you know, not really for prime time, but if someone is interested in a clinical trial, you know, that's something that the other people are looking at. All right. And just a, a, a comment for uh, the attendee that had that question. Um, I can send you, there was a uh, webinar actually done earlier this year with uh, Dr. Victor Pagato, a pediatric ophthalmologist in uh, Victoria, Canada, um, that talked quite a bit about the use of Redival in, in pediatric cases. So I can forward you that. Uh, it's recorded, so I can forward you that. Um, right. And, and one, one more thing for the pedi pediatricians, just, I, I just remembered, you know, another use of it is for drug toxicity. So there's, um, so some kids have a lot of seizures and, you know, one of the very best anti-seizure drugs is Vigabitrin. But Vigabitrin has a nasty side effect of, for some kids, having retinal toxicity. Um, so, you know, I think, I think even the FDA recommends ERGs every, I'm going to get the time wrong, so I'm not going to guess. So every every so often with kids on Vicabitrin to look for retinal toxicity. All right. Thank you very much, to Dr. Davis. Um, this question is actually for you, Dr. Davis, um, but, but Dr. Weber, if you want to chime in, please feel free. But the question is, um, would you say that it's just as reliable switching all of your DTL kind of traditional uh, electrode full field ERG tests to the retoval testing now? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I mean, so, if you have a corneal contact electrode, your amplitudes are bigger. So if you just blindly look at the amplitudes with the skin electrodes, doesn't matter what the device is, if you just have skin electrodes, you're going to go, wow, these amplitudes are small. But the advantage of the Redival device is it has really good hardware to try to keep the noise down. And there are a whole lot fewer artifacts in scan electrodes. If you have blinks are affected less, eye motion affects it less. So while the signal is down, the noise is also down. And the important thing is really the signal to noise ratio. So you can get really quality results even with scan electrodes um, with, the, with the red belt device. However, that being said, there are people who I know who are like, I like my, you know, XYZ electrode. I like my TTL electrodes. I like my Burian Allen electrodes. And with the Redival device, you can still use those. No problem. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davis. Um, this question is, um, so Dr. Weber, what, which protocol do you favor for use when you uh, have patients with diabetic retinopathy? Oh, well, um, so I, 
I like to use the, the, the protocol that has the diabetic retinopathy assessment. Um, I happen to have it on mine because we were part of a, an experimental protocol looking at a, a drug to evaluate it. Um, you know, it's a, it's effect. So I, I know that in the United States, it's, um, and perhaps, um, um, Quentin can talk about this a little bit more, but, um, so, yeah, so I do I, like I was, that. Yeah, but but so the other protocol is fine too, because it's really the same information. It just, you know, compares it to a normative database, which is also very handy. Go right. ahead, uh, just, Dr. Davis. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, but there is this, uh, yeah, we have a little bit of, you know, weirdness, I guess, to say, we have a protocol that's called the DR assessment protocol, which is the one that let Dr. Weber likes to use, um, which generates a score. In the United States, for mysterious reasons, that we, we don't currently show the score. And because we don't show the score, we had to give the protocol a different name. So in the United States, it's usually called the 28 Hertz ERG and pupil response. But you know we're working on adding the score into the uh, into into the, even the devices that are, are kind of commonly found in the United States. All right, thank you, Doctor right. uh, Dr. Davis, uh, Doctor Weber. Now, a few more questions. Um, I'll combine a couple here. So for Doctor Weber, how difficult was it to train your techs? How, how difficult was it to integrate the retival into kind of your your patient flow? Not hard at all. Um, you know, we, we like to do it when the patient, before the patient's dilated. So that that's the only thing since, you know, in a retinal practice, everybody's dilated. So so if um, if we can't do it at, at the initial visit, what I do is I put it in the follow-up note to do the ERG before dilation. And, um, and it's really not hard. We've trained several people in my office to use the device and the downloading is really easy and it gets put right into our EHR. And it's, it's really, it's really simple to use. It's 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 great. I have to say, it's a great device. Excellent. Thank you for your answer there. Um, and then another uh, question, um, um, and I guess this is for both Dr. Weber and Dr. Davis. So, um, are the ERGs that you use, or the protocols that you use for inherited retinal degenerations, are they, are they lengthy? Like, what's the average length? And do the operators ever report fatigue while holding the device for for such long periods of time? Well, I think part yeah, of the issue I, is dark adaptation, you know, so so they have to be dark adapted. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't know about holding the vi device for a long period of time. I, I think it's kind of the same. It's just maybe 10 minutes. Uh, I think you know, Dr. I, Davis can answer that. Yeah, I, I think Dr. Weber is kind of exactly right. So, I mean, the, the tests are long, but it's not like the device is on the eye for a long time. So the tests are long because if you want to get rod function, you got to let them wake up. So you got to let the doc, the patient sit in the dark for for 20 minutes or so. So kind of each test that you do, each step, you know, might be is between like five seconds is the shortest time and one minute is the longest time um, for kind of all the test steps. So then it just matters on how many test steps that you want to do. So kind of, you know, there isn't um, there isn't a whole lot of kind of stress in the operator's shoulder to use the device. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weber, Dr. Davis, for answering that. I guess uh, one last question, and this is, uh, I think, for for Dr. Davis. Um, what happens if you do a, a trolling or a TD protocol on a patient who is dilated? It, it just works. That's the short answer. The long okay. answer, the, the long answer is the trolling tests are the ones that I said that compensate for pupil size. So in order to compensate for pupil size, it has to be able to measure the pupil size. So in order to measure the pupil size, it wants to see the whole pupil. So if they're dilated, they have to open their wide eyes up really wide. So it's a little bit harder on a dilated subject to cajole them to open their eyes wide enough for the device to see the whole pupil. Uh, because the pupil's bigger. Um, other than that, kind of everything just works. It's all the same. All right. Thank you for that. And then uh, I, another question here: um, Do you? Uh, how long does the battery last after it's fully charged? Doctor Weber, I'll let you answer if you if the battery has ever gone dead on you. 
from internal and from internal trials, it lasts about seven hours. Um, but it'd be remarkable that you would actually use the device for seven hours without putting it in the docking station. No, that, no, it's, yeah, it's not a problem at all. So you know, as soon as you're done with it, you put it in the docking station. So um, it, no, it's never a problem. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I think that's it for uh, the questions for this evening. I, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Davis and Dr. Weber again for uh, spending the time going through their presentations this evening. Um, just wanted to let everybody who uh, was attending uh, know that uh, a copy of the presentation will be available on our website and YouTube channel if you want to go back and if there's sections you, you'd like to rewatch. Um, also, if you have any questions or um, uh, you'd like uh, to talk more about the Redabow, uh, please reach out to info at lkc.com and we can get back to you there. And um, I'd just like to once again thank everybody for attending tonight's presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed it and um, I uh, hope you attend uh, future presentations from LKC Technologies. And I just wanted to wish everybody a pleasant evening. And once again, thank you very much for attending. Take care.